young mother named Lynn Kane was staying at home with her nine-year-old son, John. John had the flu and couldn't go to school that day, and Lynn was staying at home with him. It was not an easy decision, however, for Lynn Kane to stay at home with John, because at that very time, her husband was in the hospital fighting a terminal illness. But she said to herself, my husband has the nurses and the physicians to take care of him. My son needs his mother today. So she stayed home. It was in the middle of the morning that the phone rang and a nervous young resident at the hospital said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your husband died this morning. Lynn said later, you know, when I heard those last five words, your husband died this morning, I don't remember anything after that. I don't remember what I felt. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember what I did. I asked John later, did I cry? And he said, no, mother, you were trying to be strong. She eventually wrote a, a book about that experience, what it felt like suddenly to become a widow, suddenly to become a single mom with a young child, suddenly to be thrust into the depths of grief. She said people tried to understand, but it was like living in a country where no one speaks your language. Like living in a country where no one speaks your language. I imagine that a lot of people who have been through deep troubles and great sorrows and trauma have felt that way. It's like living in a country where no one speaks your language. At the university where I teach several years ago, we had a PhD student from Asia. He had come to us to become a teacher and a scholar. He had come with the great pride and blessing of his parents. He had come with the prayers and the financial support of his church. But the language differences and the cultural differences and the demands of the program were simply too great. They overwhelmed him and he did not pass. Right before he went home, he came to my office and said, I have never felt such shame in my life. I do not know where I am going to be able to find the words to explain this to my church and to my parents. It's like living in a country where no one knows your language. The Reverend William Sloan Coffin, who was for many years the chaplain at Yale University, lost his son Alex in a terrible automobile accident. He said, as soon as the news about Alex went out, I received hundreds of telephone calls and cards and telegrams. He said, easily some of the best, but also some of the worst of them came from my fellow reverends. The clergy sent me cards invariably quoting scripture passages. He said, look, I, I know all those passages. But they quoted passages as if they knew the Bible better than they know the human heart. One day I will believe those passages again. But the depth of my grief rendered them untrue. It's like living in a country where no one knows your language. By the grace of God, in the scripture, we are given a language for times when no one knows our language. It's called the language of lament, and it is ruthlessly honest. It is a language for those times when we raise our fist to heaven and shake it in the face of God in rage and grief. Martin Luther once said, we are sometimes closest to God when we shake our fist at heaven. Because to do that, we have to trust God. And God has no children more dear than those who trust Him. It's important to note, I think, that the lament psalms and the other passages of lament were designed to be sung in worship. They were designed to be sung by people who weren't particularly feeling grief-stricken or enraged at God, but just used in worship on an ordinary Sabbath. That's because the language of worship is language that is held in trust for us. One day, we will all need the language of lament. Look, I'm, I'm a seminary professor. I, I'm not the pastor of a church. So some Sundays, I'm not up here. I'm out there. I'm sitting in the pews with my family. 
Many years ago, one of those Sundays, I was sitting out there with my family, and we got to the place in our order of worship where we use the Apostles' Creed. We stand and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. If you've ever been in a service where that's being used and you suddenly stop speaking and just listen, what it sounds like is a kind of holy murmur. I'm leaving God and Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Well, for some reason, I stopped speaking and started listening, and I heard a voice I had never heard before. My then 11-year-old son, David, standing in the pew next to me. David, who had a pack of baseball cards stuck in his back pocket and a wad of bubble gum stuck in his cheek, was standing there confessing Trinitarian theology. 